Let's start out with John 15. I don't know that. We'll get into it. It's John 15, 14. He says, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I'll read that. Okay, now, this says slaves, but it really means servant. I mean, it's the same thing going with it. Now, Old Testament, we know it comes out to be, they were, were always called servants of God, right? You know? Now, a friend is a servant, too, but there are such things as no friends and just servants. You know, I'll get into that so much. But he goes on to say after that, you know, you, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain. So remaining fruit is the sign, apparently, of a friend. So he says, ask so that whatever you ask of the Father. It's very interesting how he says of. Because as soon as someone puts an of on something, separation comes up, right? So as soon as you ask of the Father, in my name, he may give it to you. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say, after this I command you that you love one another. Hallelujah. Probably because love is your action. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go into it. Now, let me get into Jeremiah. Yeah, Jeremiah 25.9. Now this is what actually kind of hit my thoughts for some reason. I don't know what I was doing in this book, but the Lord's been guiding me on it. Jeremiah 25, 9. Well, I'll, yeah, yeah. It says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to you Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. So as soon as I read that, I'm like, wait a second, what are you talking about? My servant, Nebuchadnezzar? In Daniel 1, verse 1, it talks about he besieged Jerusalem. He was never God's servant there. The same definition for servant there is the same definition if we look at um, Amos 3, 7. And I'll go there real quick. It's the same definition in the Hebrew. Let me try to find it on there. Cause, okay. It says, surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. The same definition is what he laid on Nebuchadnezzar. And I know that Nebuchadnezzar was not like the prophets, you know. So I'm sitting over here and, you know, I, I begin to think about it. I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, I tried to look up things. I wasn't really coming across anything to look up. So, I mean, I maybe I could get a little bit of a hint somewhere around there. But we go on to see that, okay, if we go to James 2.23, that it says in the scripture was fulfilled which says and Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God and we know that from Genesis I think it's 18 when he goes and he says how can I hide this from Abraham now the thing I've recognized between the servant a servant is someone who does the will of God like does what he wants so for instance Nebuchadnezzar did what God wanted him to do and he, he became a servant now, a friend is a servant as well, but a friend has more of an intimate relationship. He knows what the master is doing. So, if we notice some things God would use as servants are, and other things you could tell they were friends of God. Probably Jeremiah, you know, would be considered a friend. Isaiah, these people like that. And um, now, if we look at, I think it's, yeah, 1 Kings 18 36. Now, I'm going to go fast through here. It's another representation here. 18, And this is the time when Elijah prays for the fire to come down. Now it's interesting because it says, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's interesting how he said Israel, not Jacob there, huh? <laughs> That's very interesting. And it says, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant. It's the same definition as what you laid with Nebuchadnezzar. And I have done all these things at your word. Now if we fast forward then and kind of go to 2 Kings 1, 10. 
and says, Elijah replied to the captain of 50. Now, this is after Jezebel was there. He ran, you know, right afterwards. So you can imagine what's really happening to him. You know, the angel of the Lord says, get up and eat, because, you know, he's fasting and things like that. So he probably seen these areas and was like, the Lord then gave me a hope Now, we would ask, why would he think that when God just answered him and called down fire? Now, notice something. It could have been his perception of the way that he seen the Lord. So he had to go through this to see the Lord in a brighter light. Now, in this, he goes on to say, now I'll read it right here. It says, Elijah replied to the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now, why would a man of God, after he got done going through all that, say, if I be a man of God? He just said, your servant. So, was he questioning if he was a man of God or not? That's the thing. Was he going, am I really a man of God? We're going to find out. If I be a man of God, let the fire come down. And God did it every time. Now, notice, okay, if we skip on down, he goes on to say, so again, he sent the captain the 30, or 30, 50 with his 50. When the third captain of 50 went up, he came and bowed down on his knees before Elijah and begged him and said to him, O oh, man of God. So now he's calling him, man, you're a man of God. There's just no doubt, you know. He's saying, O oh, man of God, please let my life in the lives of these 50 servants of yours. Now, that word servant is the same definition. So here's the thing. Being a servant doesn't mean you know the person who you're being a servant to. You can know certain things about them, right? For instance, if I have a servant, that servant can know certain things. But it doesn't mean they know intimately everything about you. See, So in these areas, he would do what Elijah said. Now, a little bit later on down, if we keep going... The Lord tells Elijah, go down with them and do not be afraid of them, because he did that. So, in these areas, we see if we were to bring up Elijah and Elisha, right? Laying on the pans, for instance, you know, only does so far, right? It can kind of get you into that process to really go, to kind of open your perception, to kind of take you further and kind of orchestrate things. Have you ever noticed sometimes you can lay on the pants and God orchestrates events and it's not always in our favor? <laughs> or what we think is going to be in our favor. And it's because he orchestrates his events in our lives, right? The good of those yeah, who love God. So in these areas like that, okay, let's apply, for instance, uh, Elisha and Elijah. He became a servant, right? But Elijah kept saying, stop right here, I'm going. The other prophets were a servant too. He had a lot of prophets around him, and Elisha just happened to be that one. He said, anoint him for he's going to take that place, your place, your room. In order to take that room, you would have to know what Elisha did, right? So that's intimate. So what happened was he said, stay right here, and he began to go, and he said, no, I, no, no, I'm going with you. God allowed these other prophets to come, you know um, Elisha's going to be taken today, right? Because they've not seen it from the Lord, right? They're servants of God. But in that whole thing, we see that there are prophets again, but we didn't see them having the same type of intimacy with the Lord as Elisha did. Elisha came out with the devil, you see. <laughs> the other prophets didn't. They actually served under him. You see how he was probably helping them out too and helping Elijah. The next thing you know, he comes up to where Elijah is and takes the room. Why did God say Elisha had to take the room? There were many other prophets, prophet, you know, school of the prophets back then. There were many of them. And they already knew Elijah's going to be taken up today. You know that, right? He's like, yeah, hold your peace. I don't care about that. So he kept going with them. And he says, so, you know, I, I will not leave you. Now, inside this area on it, he began to know him intimately. Now, I'm just kind of representing this as like Jesus, as we get closer with Jesus. You know, we begin to know him very well like that. Then he had the double poured out, but the others did not have it. So what did it show? It showed that he was wanting to be a friend of God, and the others, it was different. Because God's not respect their person, right? That's, that's what he says in his word. So in some of these areas, you know, people just being a servant like that. So I, I think Elijah had to go through that process to recognize, hey, man, you're a friend of God, like you really are. Because he said, I'm no better than my forefathers, right? So he had to develop that through that process. It was unavoidable. He was like, I'm done. But the angel, it was so serious that God sent the angel. He was probably physical there saying, no, dude, get up. Kept trying to wake him up, you know? So inside these areas, we begin to see that. Now, uh, the things that really kind of got me is because also in Isaiah 41, 8, and I won't go there, but 2 Chronicles 20 and 7, it also says that Abraham was a friend of God. 
Now, like I said, in Daniel 1, it showed that Nebuchadnezzar went and did that, and he was not even close to the offended God. Actually, he believed in a lot of different gods, and I can't exactly remember. I think it's one that starts with the M that he actually worshipped. So, inside these areas, we go to see that he was a servant of God to do the will of God. What God had planned, he obeyed it. That's actually where that scripture comes from, you know, like I was saying earlier as well, that Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? More than likely, those people were servants. So, for instance, a friend is still a servant, but is a servant that has been given the light of knowledge from Jesus Christ. He knows the wisdom of God behind the commands of God. So, have you ever noticed how some people, they can give you the commands and stuff and um, a lot of different things. But there are certain ones that can know the wisdom behind it, the understanding. For instance, Abraham, when he was there, and he said, I can't hide it from him. Abraham, I'm about to destroy Saul. You know, I'm about to destroy Solomon and Moron. I'm about to destroy them. This is the reason. Their sin is coming up to me. It's very grievous. You know, it's very sad. And, you know, it's provoking me. You know, the cries of people that are dying, all this stuff. is. He explained it to Abraham. And Abraham knew why he was doing it. And he was just. And Abraham could actually talk back and forth. And, oh, God, you know, far be it from you if you kill the righteous with the wicked. You see, he was able to talk back and forth. Now, notice when he came up to Lot. The angel said, "Word, God is destroying this place. They didn't go any further. They didn't go any further with it. The reason why is because it kind of tells you, was Lot a friend of God like Abraham? Probably not. He was covered by Abraham. That's what it showed. Because Abraham prayed for Lot to be saved. Now, did Lot probably become more of God? Yeah, probably. But see, that's what he had to do that one. So inside these areas, he went to say, you know, save this man. Well, actually, in the book of Peter, it's considered that Law actually was like a righteous man. Because it said he was tormented in his soul, seeing all this stuff go on. But for some reason, God didn't explain to him why he was doing it. But Abraham, he did. And I think it was very significant. I think it was showing that Abraham was a friend of God, not only a servant. And Lot was a servant of God. You see? So with that going on, it gives you more. So for instance, uh, a servant is positional. It's in position, what God wants to do on the earth. So a servant can be in the right position. If you notice, you know, it's kind of like a people that can do all this stuff or all the power or anything. It can be positional. God could be like, that's my will anyways. Good job for doing that. But if you notice, well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant. So he applies two things to servant, good and faithful, right? So that's friendship. It's intimacy. So inside these things on it, being God's friend is perceptional and intimate. That's why as you begin to get more in the secret place, your perception changes on everything. Why? Because you're developing the way that he is. Your fruit also remains. Because inside these areas, a servant can just do what his master is saying. Sometimes the master can say a little bit, well, I'm doing this because of this, go and do it. But I'm telling you, you're a friend of God. You, you begin to know a lot more. Things begin to happen. You begin to tap into things like, God, okay, what's going on? Why are you doing it? And it won't be false either. God would be like, this is why. We see it all through scripture. Jesus, even when he was being led in the wilderness and all that, he knew that Satan was going to do that. He already knew everything before it was happening. Why? Not just because he was the son of God, which I'm sure that's the reason, you know, but, but it was because his relationship with the father, he began to open it up. Now, did Jesus probably want to know everything that he knew? Possibly not, because you see it, Garden of Gethsemane, right? He knew what he was going to go through before he went through it. He began to cry out, oh, God, take this cup from me. I know what I'm getting ready to do. Now, any other person would be like, okay, I know something's coming, but I don't. He didn't. He knew. It began to hit him there. Why? Because he knew his relationship with the Father. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. That's another thing. A friend of God will begin to know these things, but he says, not my will, but yours be done. You know, notice that uh, Moses at first was a servant. He did the ten miracles, all this, but he said, I only know your acts. I don't know your ways, God. I want to know your ways. He became a friend of God. When he knew these things, huh, he became a friend. He got closer to him. He could speak back and forth with God, saying, oh, God, don't do this to Israel. Don't do this to Israel. He didn't have to, if you notice, he didn't have to sit inside the prayer room for eight hours praying for God not to do something before he got it. The grace was too much on Moses. Too much. 
you know, I, I always think about these little things. I'm sure other people do too, some, but I don't ever really hear about it as much. Like, Moses could just talk with God right there. We don't hear Moses prayed 48 hours. He went ahead and fasted 10 days before he did it. You know what I'm saying? You know, we don't hear about these things. He began to do, it was his lifestyle to fast. It was his lifestyle to pray. He had confidence before God. He came, oh God, don't do that. Please don't do it. Man, if you do that, he had an understanding. Egypt was going to talk bad about him. Your name's going to be blasphemed, God. Don't do this. How did he have an understanding like that with God? He began to know him. And God said, okay, I won't do that. You're right. I won't do it. And it's said in scripture that he repented. Now, that just means to be sorry, really. It doesn't mean change his mind. I believe he already knew what he was going to do before he did it. But he was seeing if Moses was going to take the great nation part, right? He said, I can make you a great nation. So Moses is like, this ain't about me, God. This is about you, you see. So he was truly a friend of God. Now, even in the part when he took him away from the promised land, he gave him the promised land, eternal life. And he even appeared with Jesus. It showed how special he was, right? Now, here's the thing. Every person is special to God like that. But it's up to the person to allow God to do that. So it's about what I put my time into. Hallelujah. So in these areas like that, we see that a lot when it comes to Moses. I mean, I really enjoy it reading a lot about Moses. Specific parts, because the other parts just get a little wild because all the sacrificing and all that, you know. But if you notice, like, I, I know, you know, for instance, offering here, I, I believe the offering here, I didn't look it up, but usually offering means drawing more near. So every time I give an offering unto God, I draw more near to him. Every offering is to draw me near. So everything I give unto him is to draw me near. My surrender is to draw me more near to God. You know, sacrifice, kabod, you know, inside the Hebrew, drawing near to God. So everything that Moses did, he was drawing more near to God, and it allowed God to open up and draw him back. So in these areas, if we see now, let's go to James 4, verse 4. says, now this ain't the part I'm looking at, but it's inside the scripture. It says, you adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, the reason why I applied this scripture is because it says friend. So, now if we flip that around, to be a friend of God is, not, is to be an enemy of the world, right? Hallelujah. Yeah. So, any in these circumstances like this, to become a friend of God more is not to be a friend of the world. It's easier said than done, I come to tell you. <laughs> easier said than done. We got so many distractions out there. We got so many things over here. We got so many things over here. We got so many things that happen between things that happen. But one thing is that the more that we put our mind towards him, you know, I've been tested in oh, areas, especially right now. Hallelujah. And, you know, sometimes you can sit there and go, oh, God, oh, God, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. Then, then when you start to hear, you know, the anointing is costly. <laughs> Take sacrifice. You know, you, you come to realize sometimes it isn't that you've got to surrender more as much as it is that when you surrender, you don't surrender enough. So what I mean by that is that I can surrender here and there, but God's like, I want to make you a habit out of doing this. Because if not, something's going to stick along the way, you see. It's where it goes to say, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. <clears throat> yeah. So you, that's where we kind of get into the book of Job. I won't get into it, but that's where we kind of get into it, that um, Job doesn't have to be doing anything for something to happen. Because he always has his glory that gets shown. Hallelujah. So a friend is one that will put their time in with God. I, I, can, I can constantly pray all day. I mean, it's, it's a pretty easy thing, right? I, I can walk around and go, thank you, God. Every once in a while, it just kind of pays. I ain't going to pay too much, but I can just do it for the last block. But, you know, for instance, I can do that. But how hard is it for me to take time out to get with God? Oh, it's, it can be hard. Because as soon as you start doing distraction, 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 you got to do this. you got to do this. Why didn't that come up before I thought about doing it, right? Or before I said it. I think I'm going to go and pray right now. Why did everything else start to hit me then? 
It's because the number one thing, if he can get you away from that, he's got you away from everything else. And, you know, the, the more and more I realize it, you know, the, the enemy can, you know, he, he'll allow you to constantly pray. He won't allow you to constantly be on the word, though. He won't allow you to study. He'll allow you to read it. You can just read through the word. I'm just read this like an open book. As soon as I begin to ponder on something, he's like, whoa, wait a second. You're about to understand something about God you didn't know about, you know. So really, I mean, it comes all into understanding. Understanding is what makes a friend of God. How do I get understanding? You won't have it at first. It takes the time being right, <laughs> you know. Like I said, it's not always an easy thing with that. Hallelujah. I think it's, yeah, Matthew 6, 24, I wrote that too. But that's just pretty much saying you can't serve both God and mammon, you know, the both. So with that on it, I mean, I, you know, it kind of got me very interested with it because it says servants, the prophets, and it's the same type of definition. And as I begin to ponder on it, I begin to think like, were all these people of God? And the thing that kept coming to me, they weren't. Because secret counsel could just be what he's getting ready to do. So that's, for instance, if calamity happens, someone can get told something. I, we've seen, okay, there was one time, there was a psychic that wrote in a book. In 2020, there's going to be something that happens. It was like COVID. How did she know that? She definitely ain't of God. <laughs> I can't remember what her name was. But she said in 2020, something's going to happen like that. Knew it more than most prophets knew it was coming. I knew something was going to happen. I didn't know when. Like she, she was like, here, do, you know. So, but she said it would go out the same way it came in. So, here's the thing. I don't take what she says, but how did she know that? You know, she had to have tapped into that realm. So, she definitely wasn't of God. So, there are many that could be servants and not friends. And that kind of answered my question. I, I would ponder on that for a while. I'm like, God, why, how, does, how do people fall? How does it go, Lord, Lord? Like, that's just something that's very interesting to me. Like, how does that happen? get it you know and I begin to ponder on it more and more and it seems like I got my answer like I, I, I hear like uh, I can begin to see and you know I'm, I'm not quick to go and bash for any other minister but you know ministers you know that, that friends that I've known the things already and like I begin to do these things like I begin to see this and like and then these people would be like they're a servant of God they're this they're that and I'm thinking to myself like well a lot of them probably was but some I'm like doesn't make any sense to me well it seems like this is that answer right here Hallelujah. so it is definitely possible to do that that's why it's very important that it doesn't matter anything what we go through we do not neglect time with it anything it doesn't matter if it's the worst situations it doesn't even matter if I'm doing the worst situation I neglecting time with him gets me worse into if I don't neglect time with him, if I have the time with him, he is faithful to pull me out no matter what. It might not look good for me, <laughs> but he's going to be faithful to pull me out, right? So in those ways, and that's what I was saying during worship, I was seeing him take me in different ways that angel. It was like, he was saying people cannot avoid the process. People that avoid the process now will go through it later while people are already passed through the process. And those same people that pass through will be the ones helping the people pass through the process that happen. So when he began to say that, I began to sit there and think. He said, what I've picked and done is already done. It will be like Jonah, the one that doesn't do it. Jonah couldn't avoid the process. He just delayed it. More things happened to him along the way. When God picks, he's picked. It's done. He will get them. He will get whoever it is back on course. And that's the way that he was showing me with it. Hallelujah. So God always looks at the end. He doesn't usually look at the things right through here. He looks at, this is my destination. This is where I'm going. And so, inside these areas on it, this is the things that we want to go towards. Being a friend like Abraham. Now, Abraham didn't have a burdensome. It wasn't too burdensome for him, right? It wasn't too burdensome. We also get a promise that when we ask of him, he does. Because we're a friend of God. You know, the things I've seen Abraham do, he prayed, he worshiped, heard the word of God. You probably heard it audible from God, but that's a different circumstance. We have the Bible now. Hallelujah. So it matters on exactly what we do in it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your word.
it's short and sweet today. That's what I'm going to get going. Short and sweet today.